News alert. President Trump heading into the home stretch on finding a nominee for the Supreme Court. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Sandra Smith on this Thursday morning after the holiday. Hey, Leland. After the holiday, President Trump working through the holiday on his pick. I'm Leland Vitter. Bill has the day off. The president, we're told, is just four days away from naming his choice to replace retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy. We are told he is focusing on a trio of federal judges. You see them there. So let's open it up with the A-team here on America's Newsroom. Alexander Smith, Executive Director of America Rising PAC. Mary Kissel, Wall Street Journal Editorial Board member. And Judy Miller, the Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter and author. Mary and Judy, also Fox News contributors. I always joke, you're not the A-team if you don't have a lengthy resume to read. You know, <laughs> in those intros, but it's great to have all of you here this morning. Great Everybody's looking awful yeah. chipper yeah. after the holiday. Yeah. Um, but this is this is this is a big moment, big moment for this presidency, big moment for this country. Monday night, the expectation is 8 p.m. The announcement. Expectations are building, Mary. Yeah, and I, I don't really think the president can go wrong here. I mean, I know we're sort of nitpicking over the details with these three circuit court judges, mm -hmm. but you do have three justices, judges here rather, not justices yeah. yet, <laughs> um, that you know really want to adhere to the text of the Constitution. Some have more experience on the bench than others. Amy Coney Barrett, of course, mm -hmm. uh, was just confirmed only a few months ago to the federal circuit. Um, but I, I think that the president uh, can't can't really make a mistake on this one. Pluses and minuses to his top pick so far? Well, he's building interest in this and he's building drama but I think that there's a lot of pressure on him to pick a woman and that's why even though she's the least experienced of the three top contenders the idea that he would be countering the Me Too movement by Put picking a woman and a Catholic, a woman, seven children. I mean, that's very, very impressive to the president. But it's going to be personality over the over pedigree. Mm. Interesting. And we've seen that in some of his other picks. Sort of the personality Absolutely. and the, how they get along between President Trump and whoever he picks is a lot more important. Exactly. Alexander, you're going to be responsible in any, many ways for supporting whoever <laughs> whoever this pick is, whoever it is. And in the same way, it seems as though it doesn't matter who the pick is. The Democrats are going to oppose it. True. And it's like Mary said, we sort of have an embarrassment of riches as conservatives looking at this list. I mean, it makes uh, my heart very happy to see the names <laughs> on, on this list. And all of them, I think, importantly, follow the Gorsuch model, um, where we have, you know, we have people that have a confirmed record, um, a lot of judicial writings, um, a lot of people who would follow in the same style as Justice Kennedy. And I think that what we can see is that the president is going to have a smooth sailing among Republicans. Um, and in the last confirmation process, he was even able to bring over three Democrats. In the, um, in the instance of Judge Barrett, uh, for example, she comes from Indiana. That's going to put a lot of pressure on Senator Joe Donnelly, who's up for re-election mm -hmm. in Indiana and also is in a state that the president won in 2016. So I think that there's going to be more pressure this time on senators like Claire McCaskill, Senator Bill Nelson, who voted against Justice Gorsuch. I don't know how many get out of jail free cards they have with their constituents this cycle. Mm -hmm. Perhaps what um, could paint the picture of what is to come as far as the battle after the president names his, his pick. Uh, this is Senator Dianne Feinstein to Amy Barrett during the confirmation hearing to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. This is September 6th. 2017. Watch this. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern. Okay. Yeah, I should disclose my prejudice here. Uh, uh, as a Mary Elizabeth, obviously, I am <laughs> Uh, but look, I think Democrats risk overstepping there. Um, you know, anti-Catholicism is the only acceptable discrimination in the country after Asian Americans and college admissions. Um, look, uh, I think that we do have to worry about one Republican, and that's Susan Collins of Maine. That's where President Trump really has to uh, convince her to come over the line. Uh, so much for standing on principle and sticking with the sisterhood. Uh, Susan Collins seems to be more worried about her uh, re-election prospects than the idea of putting the first truly conservative woman on the high court. Mm. We, we already heard out of Maine a liberal group has committed to spending about $5 million to counter whoever the president's pick is. It doesn't matter. And put pressure on Susan Collins and Murkowski. How do Republicans counter that? 
I think they have to talk about why textualism and originalism matters, um, why we're so thankful that Hillary Clinton is not president, because we don't want justices making up the law based on their own personal whims and preferences. And look, again, I, I agree with the panelists. It is an embarrassment of, of riches here. I personally would love to see if a woman on the court, but um, it is really Susan Collins that he's going to have to focus on. And I, I, he's never going to win over the Dems. He has to win over Republicans. I think the Democrats understand they are not going to block the nomination of anybody on this top six of the list. They, they can't do it, but they will use it to score political points. That's what this is going, all going to be about, the midterms. Mm. A final thought to you on that before we move on to North Korea. Yeah, this is a completely incoherent hashtag resist strategy on the part of the Democrats here. Mm. It's you know it's easy for someone like Elizabeth Warren to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna stand against this president and and any pick that he chooses. We're gonna stand you know someone like Cory Booker who says, well, we have to wait till the Mueller investigation's over until the president gets to choose the <laughs> Supreme Court justice. It's easy for those guys to say, you know, we're gonna oppose the president. It's really hard for those red state senators. All right, so Mike Pompeo is heading to North Korea today, the day after the holiday. Uh, certainly the effort here is going to be to somehow come back and show some sort of tangible evidence that they are working their way towards denuclearization over there. What are your expectations as Mike Pompeo makes this trip, and, and what, is, what does he need to come back with to put our concerns at ease? I think Mike Pompeo is putting himself out on a limb here because I see no evidence that North Korea wants to denuclearize. We've already given them several several tangible concessions. The U.S. president meeting with the leader of North Korea, legitimizing him in Singapore. The guy didn't come to the table with an accounting of his WMD. There was no timeline that came out of that. There was no serious threat reduction. He didn't, for instance, take troops back from the DMZ. So really, what have they done? The cooling tower hasn't been blown up. We've got uh, more activity at Yongbyon. We have now a new secret facility that's been unveiled. I mean, essentially, I think what you're seeing, and Judy may have a different opinion here. But what I think you're seeing is Kim Jong-un has banked what he got from the president in Singapore, and that's it. That's all we're going to get. All right. I think Pompeo has a very tough mission here. I agree with Mary. I think every indication so far suggests that Kim is not interested in holding up his end of the very, very loose bargain that was struck. We haven't heard about CVID for a long time, right? Comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. That is not happening. Pompeo has to nail down some specifics, or the president is not going to be able to continue to assert that we're safer today than they were before he went to uh, Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. Look, I think we can certainly agree that it was in the interests of world peace that this meeting did happen, that we tried. Um, I think what the Trump administration is trying to do is to avoid uh, what the Obama administration did with the Iran deal, um, where we you know, didn't have as strong of an emphasis on transparency, and to boot, we gave them a, a lump cash uh, payment up front. So I think that with the Trump administration, they're really looking to see complete de denuclearization and also full transparency. And I think that if we don't get those things, they're going to walk away from the table. Yeah, but what happened to the Mike Pompeo who said in January <laughs> that North Korea was only, as he put it back then, a few months away from holding the United States at risk. That's how he put it. And now he says we have time for years of negotiations and potential denuclearization. This is not how it worked with places like South Africa. It's not how it worked with Ukraine. It's not how it worked with Libya. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting that John Bolton is letting Pompeo be the one to go to the talks. Pompeo the one getting out on TV. It's Pompeo's face who's all over it, not John Bolton. Well, we, we know how Bolton feels about this issue. He's, he talked about it a lot. Uh, Judy, this is an important point in terms of the messaging that's coming from the administration. How long does the administration allow the North Koreans to keep doing the things that Mary was talking about, that you were talking about, essentially, you know, stealing from the cookie jar while they are, <laughs> while they are saying they're going to go on a nuclear diet? You mean stringing us along? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's why this trip is very important. Important. I mean, this so is, is this the red line. This is this is the third trip that Pompeo mm. has made. This is his, going to be his second meeting with Kim. He has got to show something that's measurable. We've got to have a declaration by the North Koreans of what they purport to have in the way of nuclear capabilities mm. and missiles, or it's going to be very apparent to everybody that this young leader is not that different from his father and his grandfather. And that's a real problem for Trump, who 
denigrated the nuclear deal but I, with Iran, but I will point out that in that deal, the Iranians gave up a lot of, lot of uranium. They dismantled a lot of facilities. There were deliverables. There is nothing Inspections. there so far. Right. I want to make sure that I get in there. The, the, the White House is saying that the two men will meet to continue ongoing and important work of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And the State Department issuing a statement about this travel to Pyongyang, saying it, it is to continue consultations and implement the four progress made by President Trump and Chairman Kim in Singapore. So that sets up for quite a meeting. We'll see what comes of that. Uh, he is I think any time you sit today. down with Kim Jong-un, it's quite a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Second one for these two gentlemen, right? Third, right? Uh, don't call this guy a gentleman. He's a monster, and we are losing leverage the longer that we let these That's talks right. go on because China's propping him up. China is embarrassing President Trump. They are breaking the promises that they made to the president to, to continue the maximum pressure campaign. Yeah, Jordan, Gordon Chang was saying the same thing in terms of really China's allowing the sanctions to kind of whittle away and still allowing trade with North Korea that they had promised not to. All right, we will leave it there. Peter Strzok may soon step out of the shadows. The House Judiciary Committee has subpoenaed the embattled FBI agent to testify in an open hearing. The date is set, July 10th, but his attorney now saying he may not comply. What does America want to hear from? Peter Strzok, our A-team, is back. Alexandra Smith, Mary Kissel, and Judy Miller. Uh, one viewer tweeting me when we teased this a few moments ago, what do we want to hear? The truth. <laughs> will, will, we, will we actually see him sit down and answer questions before Congress? next week. No, I'm not sure we will. I mean, he's going to have to testify somewhere sometime, but that'll be up to him and his lawyer. He's a lawyer. Therefore, whether or not you're going to hear the truth, we don't know. <laughs> but I think that there's a great deal at stake for him. You're talking about one of the most senior, senior Justice Department officials who was from marched out of the department. So he has got to protect himself. And I don't think you're going to hear anything from him that endangers him because we still have an open investigation of what he was doing with respect to the Russian But to remind everybody, this is a guy who, <laughs> he stepped up and said, I am willing to testify. He volunteered. <laughs> So then he sat down for 11 hours behind closed doors uh, with members of Congress. And, and now that, that we see a completely different situation, his lawyer says, you know, show us the transcript. Otherwise, we don't know if we're complying with this subpoena request. Yeah, this is not exactly your model G-man, right, who's supposed to <laughs> uh, stand up for uh, truth, justice in the American way. Um, look, there are a lot of very hard questions that Peter Strzok is probably going to have a hard time answering. Uh, first of all, why was Hillary Clinton given special treatment? Why was the Russian investigation prioritized over the Clinton investigation. What about all of those emails? Why the obstructionism from the FBI? How was an American citizen surveilled on the basis of a report mm -hmm. that was commissioned by the other political campaign? I mean, these are these are tough questions to answer, and, and frankly, I bet Peter Strzok doesn't want to answer them because it could get him into legal, uh, legal trouble. Mm -hmm. I think Peter Strzok is at an incredible risk of incriminating himself, which is why we see that he's now sort of backtracking and saying that he's not going to answer these questions. And I think that this is disturbing. I think when you look at the text messages that he sent prior to the election, when he said that he was going to stop Donald Trump from being president, um, you know, I think that we deserve to know as Americans whether or not this was just some abstract uh, notion of his, something to impress his girlfriend with, or if he was acting in an official capacity uh, to actually stop Donald Trump from being president. Um, you know, I think that these official communications that were sent on government devices uh, it really calls into question the objectivity of what was going on at the FBI. And it, it certainly doesn't take away from the great service of other FBI agents and the, and the department of it, you know, in and of itself. But this seems to be a bad act actor that we deserve to know the truth about. We can ask questions all day long, though. Whether or not he's going to comply with this request is, is the question. But remember, the Horowitz report concluded, the inspector general's report concluded that even though there were individuals who may have been biased and were biased, uh, there was no bias in terms of the determination to prosecute or not to prosecute Hillary Clinton. There is an open question about the Russia investigation and whether or not Peter Strzok played a role, a major role, in getting that going because that did affect, I think, the outcome of the election. I don't know. I may respectfully disagree with my friend and colleague <laughs> Judy Miller here because, you know, I read through the Horowitz report and that's right, he didn't find a statement saying we are biased against Donald <laughs> Trump. Right. But I'm 
<laughs> sorry. Over 500 pages, you read through the whole thing, and clearly they, clearly they were. Look, there is clearly a rot at the top of the FBI. And I go back again to this Russia investigation. The idea that you had a report commissioned by a political campaign taken to the FISA court and used to gain a warrant to spy on an American citizen. This is not a partisan issue. Republicans and Democrats should want to get to the bottom of this. And I, I personally uh, think it's abhorrent that Peter Strzok will not come out and tell the truth and that the FBI has closed ranks around him, including Christopher Wray, uh, refusing to give Congress the information that they need to exercise their, their oversight duties. Well, we know in that 11-hour closed-door session that uh, he was asked a lot of questions, but his lawyer stepped in and, and stopped yeah. him from answering a lot of those questions. And his lawyer, uh, Goldman, is, is, is responding to the criticism by President Trump and others uh, by accusing the president of d desperate to undermine Mueller's probe, those were his words, and viciously attacking Pete for playing by the rules, Judy. Well, I'm not sure he was playing by the rules unless you consider political pillow talk part of the rules of the game. But uh, I, the question I have about him, among every other, is how? when did he work? I mean, in between 85 texts, in between him and Lisa, you know, when did the work of the Justice Department well, and the FBI get done? It's noteworthy. The re only reason we know about all these texts between him between Strzok and Page is because they were using government devices. Why were they using government devices? Because they didn't want their respective significant others to know about their affair. Yeah. The American people, okay. Right. Not, the person, <laughs> not the people they're married to. Now look, I, I think we, the truth will come out. We will know eventually what Peter Strzok's role in all of this was. The question is, does he also at this point get due process? And I think that's why you see the hesitancy to testify, because I bet that closed-door testimony did not go well. A, a, couple, a couple of Republicans came out of that, those hearings and sort of briefed the media, said yes. they said he was smug, they said mm -hmm. he was arrogant, they said that he was dismissive. <laughs> Any reason, Mary, that he couldn't just take the fifth? No, oh, he, he, he could, but you know, the lawyer probably doesn't want him to testify because he knows the, the guy's character and he doesn't want the American people seeing that on national television, you know, separate and aside from the fact that he might have answers that may incriminate himself. But again, you know, there is a rot at the top of the Justice Department and the FBI, and we do not have leadership at either place that is helping us get to the bottom of it. Personally, I would like to see President Trump simply declassify all of these things and get it all out to the American public. Let's be done with it. Let everybody read everything. And the president has the power to do that. You know, see. But Mary, these are Republican appointees, Christopher Wray. I mean, these are, these are the president's people. Yeah. So how can you complain about this? Well, the president's, the president's fired people in the past. He can do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair yes, point. Yes, yes. Our A-team, thank you very much. Good to have you all this thank morning. Great to be here.